So I come from a rich tradition of call and response, and so I know you're not supposed to, but if you feel what I'm saying, I'm gonna need you to say, mm-hmm. <laughs> you go, girl. Mm. <laughs> there we go. So <sighs> I was very, very lucky to be introduced to Earth Force at a very young age. I was in the third grade. Um, I was what you would call a student with disciplinary problems. I had these weekly visits with my vice principal. Her name was Karen Weaver. And through our weekly talks, <laughs> she decided that I would be a good candidate for this experimental after school program called Earthwalk, which would later soon become what we know as Earth Force. Earth Force is a nonprofit organization whose focus is to engage youth in their civic responsibilities and um, help them learn about the environment by using service learning. Um, for the first time, I was asked how I feel. I was given the responsibility to make decisions for myself, but most importantly, I was given the power to define my situation. And definition is something that is really, really important because when you get to decide what a word means, what your community means, and who you are, then you set the terms. And so Earth Force gave me the ability to set the terms. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about how I define my community. I grew up in the five points, and the five points was never a once vibrant community. The five points was full of life, full of love. I grew up with NWA chants juxtaposed against MLK speeches juxtaposed against Jesus wept. My community was my home. This is the, this is the water that helped me to grow. This is where I'm from, and these are the people who I love. As I began to get older, I continued with Earth Force, and I decided to work at Swansea Elementary School. Swansea is a community of students, um, or it's a community in Northeast Denver that has been declared a super fun site. These students are primarily la Latino, they speak Spanish, they are low income. Working with the Swansea students was the greatest gift I could have ever had. These were the best kids that I've ever worked with. And I mean, we, in between doing Earth Force, them making a project based on what they defined to be the biggest problem in their community. We were singing, we were dancing, and when we went outside to play, what we looked up and saw was I-70. What we heard was the traffic, and what we smelled was the exhaust. This is an environmental justice community, and I was quite upset because <laughs> You wouldn't imagine what the impact on your own self is like when you know that you're being treated unfairly. And so I'm sitting at NYU, my first environmental class, ethics and the environment, and we're talking about global warming and climate change, and then it hits me like a brick in my face, this idea that environmental justice isn't just Denver. It isn't just Columbine which is another elementary school that I worked at. It isn't just the United States. Environmental justice or injustice is a global phenomenon. And the idea that they are sharing a disproportionate burden of our environmental degradation it was deeply problematic. So I decided two things. One, I had to learn Spanish. <laughs> if I'm going to communicate, if I'm going to make you feel comfortable, then you are going to feel easy and great speaking to me in whatever language that you choose to use, whether that language is Ebonics, I gotcha. <laughs> we will talk. And the second thing was that I had to get out of the United States. I had to see what poor people, like myself, were like in a different context. And so I decided to go to Bolivia. <sighs> Bolivia, like many Latin American states, is go undergoing and have gone on what we call neoliberal economic restructuring. And they specifically have the new economic plan, which meant that the government had to take its hands out of the social services sector, education sector, and also the idea of this ne neoliberal transfer was that we're going to open up Bolivia and we're going to allow all these multinationals come in to help develop the economy and so there'll be more jobs there'll be more growth but what ended up happening in bolivia of course what happened all over the world was this growing gap between people who had and people who had not what happened was a mass exodus of people from el campo to the city with massive poverty and lack of jobs 
So <coughs> let me tell you the story about one time in a bar in Bolivia, drinking age is 18. So <laughs> friends and I are in a bar, and these small children run in and out, in and out, in and out all the time. I'm talking from four to eight. And this makes me deeply unsettled because children should not be around. Drunk adults, drunk gringos, drunk anybody. There are spaces where I feel they should occupy. And so a little girl had come to our table. And she was particularly charismatic, I'll tell you. But I was very uncomfortable. I said, you guys, she should, she should leave. Like, she shouldn't be here. Um, when my friends decided to order her a meal, I had to take a, take a step back. I was deeply unsettled, and when I said, when I voiced this opinion, I got this, well, I'd rather give her a meal than give her money and have her take it to her mom to do who knows what with it. And it hit me again, this idea that because for some reason we have money that makes us have this power over her to decide what it is that she needs the most, the idea that her mom is an irresponsible parent and that we obviously know what's best for her. This is a deeply unsettling idea, an idea rooted in an ideology that everything that we have, we worked for. And yeah, we worked hard. But we also have to acknowledge the fact that where we are is a product of how lucky we got. We were lucky enough to be born in the United States. We were lucky enough to be born in families who cared about us, who taught us to do our homework. We were lucky enough to have schools in our neighborhood, whether they be decrepit schools, we still had them, and they were free. So there's this idea that you know, everything we have, we earned it. But no, poor people are unlucky. And that's part of the fundamental shift that we need to have. Options for influencing policy and practice. We need to change the way that we think about poverty. We need to change the way that we think about poor. No, poor people aren't pariahs. They're not selfish. They're not stupid. And they're not trying to trick you. Poor people are unlucky. And when we're thinking about poverty, when we're thinking about power, we also need to be thinking about how power is fluid. The idea that someone can empower you to do something better with your life. It's an idea that someone can give you something that you didn't have before. And the idea is, and that the idea is that instead of using our power, what if we decided to give it away? When we're thinking about advocacy, we want to ship we want to shift our thinking from advocacy to empowerment. I was empowered as a youth because I was given the power to define and to think and to question. I was given the power to make my own decisions. I was given the power to define who it is that I wanted to be. We also need to think about shifting from a model of paternalism to a model of faith. And I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about I have faith in you that you are going to do what's best for your family. Now, this is hard because coming from my background, studying food politics in specific, we like to get really, you know, health policy. We want to say, like, people shouldn't be able to eat this or that. We need to eliminate these options. They're, they're doing all these bad things. There's rapid obesity. We, we have these ideas, and then we say, we need to make sure that all these people are doing X, Y, and Z. Like, they're doing it wrong. Like, we put the onus on the person instead of on the system. And if we gave them faith, but if we also gave them enough options, we need to know that as a person, they're going to make those right options. And we need to have faith that they will. And so the idea is a relinquishing of our power. And obviously, power gives us what we need. It puts us where we are. It gives us these options to influence. But the idea is that we are overpowered. And there are some people who could use some. <laughs> there is an idea 
of sacrificial love. And I want to explain, I want to expand that and talk to you today. And so the idea is that by relinquishing our power, it's a sacrifice. We're doing something that maybe we don't want to do to serve the best interest of somebody else. And sacrificial love, if we think about it, is the only thing that's going to move us forward. We're not going to evolve anytime soon. I'm not going to grow an extra limb. The thing that's going to save our race as humans is an evolution in how we think. And if we start thinking and using an ethic of sacrificial love, just imagine what climate change and climate mitigation would look like. Just imagine if we sacrificed some of our privileges that we have in the West in order to help the mitigation of climate change in the South. If we use this ethic of sacrificial love, if we sacrifice our power, if we sacrifice our cars some days, Maybe meet some days. But just think about the impact that we can have. <sighs> and so, we have this idea of sacrifice already. It's not something we have to grow into. Mothers and fathers sacrifice all the time, saving up for their kids to go to school, working two jobs. It doesn't matter. We have this ethic of sacrifice when it comes to our families. The question is, how do we expand our ethic of sacrifice to the universal family? And so the thing about religions that I really appreciate that always gets missed is this ethic of universal brotherhood, this ethic of you're my sister, this ethic of we are family. If we adopted some of those ethics, maybe it could change the way we think. Maybe when we're thinking about sacrifice, we'll be able to expand it, expand it to that universal family. And so I'm talking to you today about Earth Force and the steps that you've already seen. These are the steps that students take to create action projects in their communities to address issues that they find to be valuable. This is also a model that I've used personally in order to really think and hash out my ideas about justice, my ideas about what I'm doing, my ideas about how I should be acting towards other people. So when we're thinking about these steps, they're just not an action plan. Think of these steps as a way to think about the work that we're doing. Um, and I'll use these last few minutes to talk to you about the work that I'm doing. Um, right now, a group of friends and I have started Students for Racial and Social Justice. Um, and the idea is that by pairing up with the pariah people, we're talking about prisoners and convicts. We're talking about social justice um, in terms of the criminal justice system. We are taking what we have is powerful. We're, we're college students, you know, we don't have to worry about food. We have meal plans, so. <laughs> but we're also in this position of power that we didn't know we had before. And so the idea is, how do we give that power to someone who needs it? Just the criminal justice system. And so um, talk to me about students for racial and social justice. And thank you so much for your time today. <laughs>